Now, to bring a story like Harry Potter from the page to the screen, the starting point is your original novel, written by you, of course, J.K. Rowling. And the script is based on that novel, but is written by the screenwriter, of course, you, Steve Clovis. Can you explain both how you work together to produce the final script? Because it must be very, very different writing a book as compared to writing a film. Yeah, I mean, you know, I just... I just steal her best stuff. Um, That's you know, basically and, and take it. And I don't sue. Um, no, I think the thing, what, what's always been great about Joe is that um, she's, from the beginning, she gave me tremendous elbow room. But when you're, when you're in the middle of a series um, like this, it's important that I, that I talk to Joe along the way and ask her, beyond advice, just simple advice on certain sequences and things, but just Am I on the right path? And Joe's always been good about, you know, she's maddening in the sense she will not tell me what's going to happen, but she will tell me if I'm going down the wrong path. I've given you more than I've, ever, I've given anyone else, which I probably shouldn't say on, on, on screen, <laughs> or they'll kidnap and torture him. <laughs> we need him. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I've told Steve probably more than I've, I've told anyone else, because he needs to know. So because it's incredibly annoying of me when he says, well, shall we cut that, or, or um, I wanted to do this, and I, I said, well, yeah, well, no, because, you know, in book six, uh, something will happen, and you'll need that in, or you'll, you know, that will contradict something that happens, and I, I, can, either, I can feel him on the end of the email, so I'm like, do you mind telling me why? So I have told him things. But he's very good at guessing. He's, he's, he's guessed more shrewdly than anyone else, I think. How frustrating is it for you working slightly in the dark with some of these issues, Steve? Well, it's frustrating because you know you like you, you like to know where when you're writing a character you like to know where they're going. I'd tell you if you were dying. <laughs> that's that's nice to know. Um, but you don't need to know at the moment. I am. You know, I mean, you know, I am. I am dying. Hopefully, it's just going <laughs> to it's going to take a while. Um, I think. Um, yeah, it's it's only you know it's it's frustrating just that you you know again it comes down to the details and the magic of those details and I think what's yeah you know, just reading the books is such a, a wonderful experience. There are so many rich details in the books. Can you tell us how you decide what goes in and what stays out? I, I will sometimes ask Joe. I mean, I will say, you know, this detail, you just seem to have cast just a bit more light on this in this scene than the other details. Sometimes I'm wrong, but often she'll say, no, that's, that is that is going to play. I won't. There's, there's one thing in Chamber, actually, that you know, Joe indicated will play later in the series. I mean, the hardest thing for me, honestly, is I'm writing a story to which I do not know the end which is, I'm not going to lie to you, it's been the case sometimes in my own originals, I, but, I, I, but I assume I will find an end. Um, with this, it's just I'm writing a story over a decade, in a, you know, since, and, I, and, I, and I keep waiting, you know, I keep hoping that Joe will slip up and actually tell me something, you know. <laughs> in this movie, we've seen the kids develop from the first film. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the relationship between Harry, Ron and Hermione and how that is developing film by film? Um, well, I think it is um, developing in the film as it does in the books, which is, um, which is to say that they are, they're much stronger together than apart, and they're much um, more aware in the second film of their particular strengths. So um, they're more effective. They do, they're, the children are able to do more um, complex things, for example, the Polyjuice Potion. And also Chris in, in the second film has kind of foreshadowed what I don't do until the fourth book which is that you get hints of certain feelings between the three of them that belong to a, a sort of slightly more mature um, person. Steve? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, you know, you're, you're seeing in Chamber that magic's becoming a bit second nature to them, mm -hmm. at least simple magic is, and that uh, it basically it's, you know, a little bit of knowledge will get you into a lot of trouble. Um, and, and I think that's what we're seeing in the second one is that they're getting more mature, but they're still, you know, it's just, it's, it's a dangerous kind of knowledge. How do you feel about what the kids were like in this movie? You know, the first thing you notice when you watch the movie is that, you know, Harry and Ron's voices have dropped about two octaves, which is just <laughs> bizarre. And suddenly they're not these cute little moppet heads running around. It's like, you know, uh, children will grow, you know. Steve, Hermione is a character who you've said in the past is one of your favorites. Does that make her easier to write? Yeah, I mean, I like writing all three, but I, I, I've always loved writing Hermione because I just, one, she's, uh, she's, a, she's a tremendous character for a lot of reasons for a writer, which also she can carry exposition in a, in a, in a wonderful way because she, you just assume she read it in a book. If I need to tell the audience Absolutely something... Absolutely right. I find that all the time in the book. You need to tell, you, if you need to tell your readers something, just put it in her. There are only two characters you can put it convincingly. 
into their um, dialogue, and it, one is Hermione, the other is Dumbledore. Because yeah, in both cases, you you accept it's it's plausible that they have. Uh, well, Dumbledore knows pretty much everything anyway, but that Hermione has read it somewhere. So she's she's handy. Yeah, she's really handy, and and she's she's also just I think tremendously entertaining. There's something about her, you know. Her, her fierce intellect, coupled with a, a you know a complete lack of understanding of how she affects people, sometimes <laughs> that I find, I just find charming and irresistible to write. Does Dumbledore speak for you? Oh yes, very much so. Yeah, Dumbledore often speaks for me. <laughs> I mean, how do you see Dumbledore, Steve? Uh, I think Dumbledore's a fascinating character because I think um, he he obviously sort of imparts great wisdom that comes from experience. But I've always I've always felt that Dumbledore bears such a tremendous dark burden, and he knows secrets, and I think, he in, in many ways, he bears the, the weight of the future of the wizard world, which is being challenged. And, um, and the only way to sort of, that he can keep that at bay, the darkness, is to be sort of whimsical and, and humorous. And I think that's just an interest, it's just a really interesting thing. I think he's, he's, he's a character of so many layers, and I think when he does say something, that it is our choices and not our, our abilities. I just think it's, it, coming from him is somehow, it doesn't feel like a sermon, it doesn't feel like a message, it just feels like, you know, an absolute truth. And it's, uh, it goes down easy, you know, and uh, I like that about him. But that's what I like about the books. I've always said that I thought that, that Joe's writing is deceptively, you know, profound, which is that you never feel there are messages in there. And, and um, but there's a lot of things being dealt with in a very sort of clever way. And they're, they're never pretentious, the books. And I think it's why kids love reading them. I mean, you say that you don't set out to put particular messages in each book. They grow organically. But do you think it's important to have the right messages there when they do emerge? Well, I, obviously, I, in the wizard world, passes for racism. Um, that was... That's deeply entrenched in the whole plot. You know, there's, there's this issue going on about the, the bad side, really, advocating a kind of genocide um, to exterminate what they see as these these half-blood people. So that was obviously very conscious, but the other messages do, do grow organically. Um, but I've never, I've, no, I've never set out to teach anyone anything. Um, it's, it's been more of an expression of my views and feelings than um, sitting down and deciding what is today's, today's message. Um, and I do think that Although I, I never again sat down consciously and thought about this, I do think, judging even from my own daughter, that children respond much better to, to that than to um, thought for the day. What was the most important difference in doing the story for Chamber of Secrets as opposed to the first film? Um, we, we probably had more contact on the first film, but then we probably needed more contact on the first film because we were establishing a relationship that, is, that has now lasted two years and is going to last uh, hopefully longer. So, you know, that was really about getting to know how, um, what we needed from each other. Um, so it's probably a good sign that we had less contact on Chamber because I think we, there was, there's a lot of trust there. I mean, I, I was very um, prickly when I met Steve because uh, I knew they, they'd chosen this American guy. Even though he wrote and directed one of my favourite films, was Fabulous Baker Boys, I still thought, well, you know, he's American. <laughs> Not to be... I don't know, I just... I, I, was, he was, I was most worried about meeting Steve. He was the writer. He was going to be ripping apart my baby. And um, turns out I really like him, so that worked. <laughs> how do you communicate? How does all that work, and how often? Uh, varies um, to what we're doing at the time. Owls. Owls mainly, obviously, a bit of flu powder. <laughs> How does this film differ from the first? I think it, it was an... It is, I think we would both say, an easier book to transfer into a film, isn't it? There's a... It's, um, the first one is episodic. You have individual adventures. It chops and changes more. And I remember when we were working on the script of Philosopher's Stone, that was something that came up continually, wasn't it? That you have these um, sort of discrete adventures. Um, and Chamber is, is a more... It's a, it's a more linear structure, so it was easier to translate to screen, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, though I, though I thought it was going to be easier than... Than it actually uh, turned out to be. Because <laughs> uh, you do have that sort of Tom Riddle moment where Tom explains it all, and that's always challenging in a movie. Yeah. Um, and also, w what's interesting about, I think, what makes Chamber interesting is that things are occurring that you don't really quite understand until... Tom explains them mm -hmm. at the end. So you've got you've got to work toward that moment and hope you can hold the audience during that moment. But it, but there's no question it, it had more of a sort of it just had more of a tight plot to yeah. sort of uh, play out. And what were the biggest challenges for you in this film? 
I mean, the challenge always for me is, you know, keeping it from being four hours because I, I like everything, you know, that what, what I, re, I honestly think is magical about what Joe does is that is the details. And so my first drafts are always chock full of details. I mean, I think the thing for me is the things I respond to sometimes, you know, are hard to, to, to sort of put in proportion. I mean, I was really interested in the whole mud blood thread. Um, so that become, that became a very interesting emotional thing for me to write in the script. I don't know that it's still there in the way that, that I saw it entirely. Um, but that was, a, you know, those, you, you want to give them, uh, some of those things weight in some way. So, so that becomes the challenge in many ways. But it's mainly compression. And Joe, were there any bits of Chamber of Secrets that didn't reflect the way that you originally saw it in your mind? It's interesting what Steve says about the mudblood um, theme because I would agree, but that's, that's always pressure of time and space with the film, that um, that is a stronger theme in the book. And yet it is, it is present in the film. But um, for me, I suppose, I, when I look back on that book or I think about that book, that is, that, that is the time in the overall series where the issue of pure blood becomes, um, becomes very important. So, yeah, maybe, maybe more weight to that. What stands out most in this film? It was scary. I've always thought Chamber of Secrets, people underestimate how scary that book is. And in fact, it's the book I've got the most complaints about, bizarrely. Possibly because people got upset at Chamber of Secrets and didn't carry on reading the rest of the book. So, um, and I think that's certainly translated to the screen. A couple of really frightening moments. The visual effects are a huge part of bringing the magic to life. In this film, we have Dobby, we have the Pixies, we have Forks, we have the Basilisk. What do you make of the effects in this movie? Dobby's wonderful. Dobby's, Dobby's really, really good. And the mandrakes, superb. I really love the mandrakes. Is that a big challenge for you, Steve, getting the effect, or well, getting those scenes right? No, no, it's easy for me, because I, I just write it and dream it, and, and, and then and someone else has to actually do it. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, but I'm amazed when you see something like the mandrakes, which is really, it's, it's essentially um, puppetry. Which part of Chamber of Secrets were you most excited to see on screen? I was most worried about the spiders. Because you see these old um, sci-fi movies where you have giant spiders and they're always hysterically funny. They're yeah. never, never scary. And it's easy to write a scene like that in a novel um, and make it scary. But when I started thinking about how we were going to actually see that, but in fact, it is extremely frightening. They're the most frightening large spiders I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, I, I had the same concern. I just thought, you know, as I was writing, I was saying, how are we going to do this? Yeah. You know, you've got, you know... You know, got Aragog saying, who goes there, basically? You know, this giant spider. And you're saying, this is just going to be hysterical. <laughs> you know, it's, I'm sorry. It's just I'm laughing as I'm writing it. But uh, we know, imagining it being... Yeah, but, but the one thing you learn about movies is that the thing you're the most worried about often is the thing that's not a problem. And the thing you don't you worry, worry about, about is a complete disaster. <laughs> so um, I, it's been... I've found that all... I mean, it's funny, you know, you talk about the, the scares in the movie. I mean, um, the, I know the thing that, that terrified my son the most in the first movie was opening the book and the book screaming. And I think it was because it was something he, he could identify with, yeah. which is he could take a book yeah. off the shelf and open it and, and there might be a face in there screaming. He wasn't scared by the other things at all. But I think I wrote that those are the sort of details I write because they, that, that would scare me. Yeah. You know, I read all the time and ask just to open something and have it shriek at me. Um, and one thing that I thought was well done in, um, in the film, in Chamber of Secrets, was um, the diary. Now, the diary to me is a very scary object, a really, really frightening object, this manipulative little book. The temptation, particularly for a, for a young girl, to pour out her heart to a diary, which was never something I was prone to, but my sister was. And I, the power of something that answers you back. And at the time when I wrote that, I'd never been in an internet chat room. But I've, I've since thought, well, it's very similar, just typing your deepest thoughts into the ether and getting answers back, and you don't know it's answering you. And so that was always a very scary image to me in the book, and I thought it worked well in the film. You could, you could understand when he started writing to see these things coming back to him. Uh, the power of that, that secret friend in your pocket. Yeah, I always loved that in the book. I, I thought that was just one of the great, that someone's writing back to you that you do not know who they are, and there is something inherently ominous in that, but the fact that they also know, they, they know the secret you want to know. Um, and they're inviting you, you know, it's like a finger beckoning you. Uh, but into, you know, into the past. It just, uh, that I always thought that was an incredibly interesting concept. How different has it been working on the script for now the next movie, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban? Well, we've just started. Um, 
I mean, I honestly think it's 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 gone as as well as any of the others, and I think it's. Um, I mean, personally, I feel it, it, it's going to be the best movie. Um, yeah, I, I, I already true. I think we're at a better place than we've ever been on the script, mm -hmm. um, and we're and we're months from starting shooting. So I I think it's it's the it's the best place we've been. I think three could really really be interesting. Yeah, I agree. Where does three stand in your list of favorites? Oh, it's, it is. I know it's very corny and all right to say it, but it is like children, choosing between your children. It really is. I, but I, I have a very soft spot for, for um, three because of um, a couple of the characters who crop up there for the first time. Um, Lupin and Black, obviously, very important characters, and, um, yeah, I'm really fond of them. I mean, so far you've had two very successful collaborations uh, on Harry Potter. What are your hopes for the future of the Harry Potter series? Um, well, I hope Steve keeps writing the scripts, because um, I'm used to him now, you know. Just keep being faithful to the books, I suppose, from my point of view. I'm bound to say that, aren't I? Oh, J.K. Rowling and Steve Clovis, author and scriptwriter. I'm sure we're looking forward very much to uh, the results of your future collaborations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.